Howdy everybody. Today we are gonna to learn how to stop a significant bleed or a major bleed. This is Amanda. She is going to be my happy willing victim today. Um, no knives involved though, you're good. So critical bleeding, massive bleeding, what is that? So some people are like, you know, they cut their finger and they see a little blood and they freak out, which is okay. It's blood, it's scary, but that's not a critical bleed. What we're talking about today is how to stop something that is spurting something that is free flowing rapidly or something if the person's laying down that it's pooling on the ground. That is what is considered a critical or a major bleed. These are life threatening and they're one of the few things that you can actually do to save a life in the field is stopping that bleeding. So I want people to have some takeaways on this and that is every red blood cell counts. You want every red blood cell that you can keep inside your body to stay inside your body. Another takeaway, tourniquets are not as scary as we all thought. We were all trained, maybe not the younger generation, but all of us were trained that the second you put a tourniquet on, it should be your last resort. And when you put it on, you're gonna lose that limb. That's not true. We've had a progression of research and experience now that shows that that's just not the case. How that happened, unfortunately, is through war. So World War I, World War II, when a soldier had a major limb injury, a tourniquet was put on, and it was hours and hours and days before they saw a higher level of care. Then Korea came along. We had medevac helicopters. We had medics in the field. Those medics were able to put tourniquets on or pressure dressings on, and that soldier got to a MASH hospital in a much shorter time than they did in World War I and World War II. Then we had Vietnam. All of these progressions, all of this training, now they're getting into a medevac hospital much, much sooner. And they started noticing, we're not losing limbs anymore. We're not, that tourniquet did not mean automatically that you had to have an amputation. Then we had Desert Storm and Afghanistan. And they started actually studying this. So what those studies found is you can have a tourniquet on for up to two hours and have zero tissue death to that limb. You can actually go even further than two hours. You might have a little bit of tissue death, especially around the side of the tourniquet, but the limb is still savable. Even more importantly, the soldier's still alive because that tourniquet kept those red blood cells inside their body where they could do their job of carrying oxygen. So with all of that progression from the military then to the civilian world, it's coming to a point now where people are learning that for these limb bleeds, these extremity bleedings, one of the first things you wanna think about is a tourniquet. So instead of the last resort, it's now a first line resort along with pressure dressings. So now that we know that, and it's hard to get that mental tweak to go, oh, tourniquets not bad, tourniquets are actually good and useful. What do we do? What do we do with that information? What we do is if we come upon a situation where somebody has a major limb bleed, you wanna look at what is an extremity bleed? So an extremity bleed is anything from here down and anything from here down, your extremities, your limbs, your arms, your legs, that is where you're gonna put a tourniquet on. If you have a head wound, you are not gonna put a tourniquet around their neck. That would be bad. So only the arms and the legs. So now that we know the history of the tourniquets, we know that they're okay, what do we do if we have somebody with an extremity bleed? You wanna deal with scene safety first. Is it safe for me to go in and take care of that person? You don't wanna become another victim. So if they're under a car and it's precariously tweaking, moving around, you wanna make sure that's stabilized. If they're on the side of the cliff, you wanna make sure you can safely take care of this person. So is your scene safe? You wanna do an evaluation. What does this person need? 
We're dealing with major bleeds right now, so that's what we're gonna focus on. So there's two major ways to stop an extremity bleed. One is with a pressure dressing, and the second is with a tourniquet. I wanna talk a little bit um, about the pros and cons of each before we go into how to apply them. Pros and cons of a pressure dressing. These are a little slower to apply. It takes a little bit more time and you have to recheck it a little bit more frequently than you do a tourniquet. What are the pros? The pros are you're not completely stopping the blood flow to that limb. So you don't have a time limit worry where you might have tissue death setting in. So those are the pros and cons of a pressure dressing. Pros and cons of a tourniquet. Very fast to put on. It's something that if you have a lot of patients or say Amanda has more than just an extremity injury, say she has a lot of injuries that I need to address, but she's got this bleeding that's going on, I can put a tourniquet on there rapidly and then help address her other injuries. So all of these things are a thought process when you come up to somebody with a severe extremity bleed or other injuries of what can I use? Another thing that you need to think about when you're trying to decide whether to use a tourniquet or a pressure dressing is what do I have on hand? Do I have a commercially available tourniquet or am I going to have to cobble one together? Do I have the ability to do a pressure dressing? Just some things to think about. What am I gonna use? If I have a lot of victims, I'm gonna use a tourniquet because I can put the tourniquet on a lot of victims and take care of it that way. If I have the time and it's just her and I, and she just sliced herself really good because she slipped when she was making us some great steaks, um, then I can take the time to put a pressure dressing on. All right, so how do we do that? Pressure dressings consist of some sort of bulky material that is going to cover or go in the wound, depending on how severe the wound is, and a stretchy means by which to attach that bulky dressing to the limb. Stretchy is a very important aspect here. How you would do that, say Amanda has a, a big cut right here. If it's gaping open, this doesn't happen so much on arms, but on legs, if it's gaping open, you would take this gauze and you would jam that gauze in the wound. I know that sounds gross and scary, but you wanna put pressure where the bleeding is, and that's down deep in the wound where the veins and the arteries are. You're gonna jam that deep into the wound, take more bulky dressing and place it over the wound, and if Amanda's able, or your victim is able, or you have somebody else there to help, you can have them put their hand on it while you get your roll of gauze ready. And how you're gonna do this roll of gauze is you're gonna start it. You can take your fingers out now. You're just gonna roll it around a few times by itself. And I'm gonna teach you a trick. So you can sit here and just pull it tight like this. And that will work. But a little trick to really improve the effectiveness of a pressure dressing is as you come around, you twist that gauze. And you wanna twist that gauze right over the top of where that injury was. And what this does is it just helps build up more pressure over where that wound is. So you're gonna pull, pull it tight, twist, and wrap. Come around, pull it tight, twist, and wrap. Again, and you're gonna continue to do this. Come around, twist, and wrap. You're gonna do that until the entire area is covered and hopefully your bleeding has stopped. If you're doing this pressure dressing and the blood is soaking through all of this, you can try putting another pad on or you can realize this isn't gonna work and I need to move on to a tourniquet. Some little key differences between pressure dressings and tourniquets. You notice that we put this right over the wound. That is how a pressure dressing works. It's putting pressure directly over the wound. A tourniquet, and if this is soaking through and not stopping, or if I just came upon and, and realized right away I'm not gonna bother with a, with a pressure dressing, I'm gonna go straight to the tourniquet. 
A tourniquet is designed to work above the wound. This is putting pressure directly on the ripped veins and arteries. This is stopping it above the wound. So with a tourniquet, you want to get this at least two inches above the initial wound. Now you see there's a joint right here. The whole mechanism that a tourniquet uses is pressure around soft tissue, squeezing down on an artery. So if this is the artery and this is the soft tissue, you're squeezing that soft tissue down tight enough that it stops that artery. If you've got hard bone, you've got a joint, you can't squeeze that tissue down around that artery enough to stop it. So with a tourniquet, you want to come at least two inches above the wound. They used to say, get it as close as you can because then when they amputate, they're only losing a, you know, a less amount. But now we know that that's not the case. They're not going to have to amputate. So if you've got a joint right here and a wound right here, go above the joint. Put that tourniquet on. You tighten it up as tight as you can get it. Affix the Velcro so it's nice and tight. And this little goodie right here is called a windlass. And this is a key component of a tourniquet. This allows you to tighten this up using basically a, a lever, a fulcrum. You cannot create a tourniquet by just pulling this tight. A lot of people say, oh, I'll use my belt as a tourniquet. You cannot properly put on a tourniquet just by pulling a belt tight or pulling a bandana tight. They've done some studies that show that 99% of improvised tourniquets that are put on without what's called a windlass, this way to force it with leverage to be tighter, fail. Whereas only 32% of improvised tourniquets that have a windlass mechanism fail to work properly. So with a commercial tourniquet, almost all of them come with some way to a windlass, some way to use leverage to tighten it. One exception is called a SWAT T. This is a CAT combat application tourniquet. This is called a SWAT T, a stretch, wrap, and tuck tourniquet. And it's named that way for basically how you use it. This is one of the only ones that does not have a windlass that is shown in the battlefield to be very, very effective. I like to carry two in my kit because with overlanding, space and weight are an issue. And this has multiple uses. You can use it as a tourniquet. You can use it as a pressure dressing. You can use it as a sling. You can use it to help affix a stick to use a splint. Just a lot of different uses for this. But with this, we've got it two inches above the wound. We've got it as tight as we can get it. And now we start to turn. Now I am not going to put this on like a real tourniquet. I'm just gonna do a little bit and you're gonna see her face. Putting on a tourniquet properly hurts. It hurts the person that you're putting it on. Imagine in an inch and a half putting a lot of squeezing pressure on your limb. One of the reasons they fail is because it hurts to put on. So as they're twisting, that person is starting to, to yell at them and really scream out in pain. But you have to put that away in your mind and know that you have to turn this tight enough to get that bleeding to stop. Not slow down, but stop. So you are twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting until all of that bleeding stops. Once you have that as tight as it needs to be and that bleeding is stopped, the cat tourniquet comes with this nifty little way to hold that windlass in place. If you're doing an improvised tourniquet and you're using a bandana or a t-shirt and say your jack handle or something else for a windlass, then you're gonna need to think of some way to secure that windlass so that it doesn't unspin itself once you're done. That is a good use for your belt. Put that on above and hold that windlass in place. 
So now I've got this tourniquet on, what are some of the things I want to do from here? Well, here's where you stop and you reassess. Is the bleeding stopped, yes or no? If no, sometimes you might need to put on a second tourniquet, especially if you're putting a tourniquet on somebody's thigh, especially if it's somebody that's very muscular or very chunky, they may need two tourniquets. To put on a second tourniquet, you're just going above the first one. So if you have another tourniquet, you're starting out for this particular brand, you're starting out, get it to where it's holding on itself. And then if you see here, these got little rectangles. If you leave it rectangle, then it's a pressure dressing. If you pull it tight enough that those rectangles become squares, now it's a tourniquet. And again, I'm not gonna do this for real because it will hurt, but you just continue to wrap, pulling this each time to where they're squares until you get to the very, very end. And then you are going to tuck the end in. Now you're reevaluating again. By this time, your bleeding is stopped. Now you're gonna reevaluate your entire patient. Is there any other injuries I need to address? Anything else I need to take care of? And very, very importantly, you're gonna mark the time that you place the tourniquet on and the fact that this person has a tourniquet on them. And this is the old school that everybody's heard about. You mark a T on the forehead with their blood. You can use a Sharpie or a pen or anything else. But if you don't have that, yes, you wanna mark on their face that they have a tourniquet applied. Why do you wanna do that on their face? Well, because they're probably going to be covered up with a blanket and packaged in some sort of litter to take out to further medical care. But something that any healthcare provider is going to immediately do is look at their face. Are they breathing? Are they talking? Are they conscious? And when they see a T, they're going to know, oh, okay, I have a major extremity bleed that I need to take care of. This person has a tourniquet somewhere and we need to address that immediately. So this is all the progression of how to apply a pressure dressing, how to apply a tourniquet, the pros and cons of all of those things, and how to stop a major bleed. So I hope your takeaways with this, again, are every red blood cell counts. You want to keep it in the body. And tourniquets aren't scary. They, they should be almost your first go-to in a critical situation with an extremity bleed. Somebody with an extremity bleed, there should be no reason why that person should bleed to death when these two things are eminently easy to use and can be taken care of in almost any field situation. One thing I did not cover, people always say, well, what, if, what do I do while I'm fumbling around getting all of these things and the person's laying on the ground? You know, that whole concept of every blood cell counts, stopping that bleeding immediately while you're getting ready. And one thing you can do is kneel on the injury. Kneel directly on the wound, kneel directly on what's bleeding and get that initial pressure with your knee while your hands are free, getting the equipment that you need to then put on a proper pressure dressing or a tourniquet. So I hope you guys have all enjoyed this class on how to stop a major extremity bleed. Get your equipment, learn your equipment, be comfortable with it, and go out there and enjoy. Yeah.